welcome everybody. And first of all, thank you for the nice introduction and for the, for the invitation to Aranza, the director, Marcel. So um, today I'm going to present for the first time. So perhaps there are a lot of mistakes in the slides. Sorry, I finished them tonight. <laughs> and this is a completely new result uh, about, let's say, theory of homogenization from the mathematical, pure analytical point of view that involves, for the first time, as far as I know, non-local linear operators in fractional divergence form. And this is done in collaboration with two young colleagues, Michael Caponi and Alessandro Carbotti, um, both Italian from different universities. And as much of my collaboration, it was born during a coffee break in a conference, just for fun, and then uh, discussing and so on. At some point, it became really a project. Um, OK, the plan of the talk is at the beginning to introduce, let's say, a historical background on the topic. As Aranza told me a few weeks ago, like an analyst, we are lucky because we can steal something from physics or from engineering. So we have something to discuss at the beginning to make it more interesting, let's say. And then, sorry, we have to go deeply into the our setting, which is the non-local one. And then I will present the main result and just a sketch of the proof. But if you are interested in more details, please let me know. So the results should still appear. I hope by the summer break, it will be online. So everything is totally new. And if you have ideas, suggestions, please tell me. Yeah. Everything is welcome. OK. Uh, the Starting point, let's say we are in Paris, uh, 1970, somehow, the school of Jacques Louis Lyons, and in particular, a uh, um, mathematical physicist, I think is the correct pronunciation, who is named Sanchez Palencia. He is born in Madrid, but he's considered a French mathematician. I don't know why. And um, he is the really starting point of the story. And the story is, this, is the following one. So we are interested in the study of heterogeneous materials. So think, for instance, the overlapping of different materials or mixture of different materials with elastic properties or whatever it is. And in physics, the questions we are interested in are in divergence form. So we have, let's say, minus divergence of a matrix A depending on x, because we are interested in heterogeneous materials, times the gradient of u equal to a third term f. And in uh, most 99% of the application, the matrix should be symmetric. But please, if you know examples in which it, is, it cannot be symmetric, let me know because we are looking for them for, to, to write a nice introduction. And, um, an um, important role in this theory is played by the momentum, which is the matrix A times the gradient. Examples, uh, well-known examples in physics or engineering are equation of electrostatics, magnetostatics, or time-independent heat transfer. But also if we move to elasticity, we have other examples. So uh, in all the presentation, U is a scalar function. So from Rn to R, this is important. OK, mm, in the case in which we would study homogeneous materials, then the matrix C will not depend on x. Why is this important? Because problems appear when the matrix A, the coefficient of the matrix A, start oscillating a lot. And from a numerical point of view, it's really hard to approach this problem. So the theory of the homogenization is to approximate, in some sense, the study of this problem, so the necessity of finding solutions to this problem, by studying a limiting homogeneous case, and then to study how far we are from the original solutions. And as I said, in France in 1970, it was studied the so-called asymptotic expansions of solution, which is the real mathematical starting point. But we are not really interested in this, just to make a precise introduction. Uh, what we are going to introduce is instead what nowadays is called the H-convergence theory. The H-convergence theory, so now I go mostly into mathematics, 
can work also for possibly non-symmetric matrices, which is uh, um, much more difficult to treat, that satisfy, let's say, standard growth condition. So in the case of symmetry, we will have the um, uniform ellipticity and the coercivity condition. And we are going to study problem of minus divergence matrix time degradient equal to F, Dirichlet problems. So U equal to zero on the boundary of omega. Omega for us will be always an open and bounded uh, subset of our N. N greater than two, greater or equal than two, only because we are interested in matrices. But once we move to fractional case, we should be um, delicate with the choice of the dimension and the fractional index. So um, here we define capital M, depending on two constants, lambda small and capital lambda and omega, the class of such matrices. Why should we work with classes? Because all of this theory is given for classes. So it's difficult to define the H convergence like a general statement, like gamma convergence that uh, I um, introduced before for the class. Um, but we have to work with classes of matrices. So we consider a sequence of elliptic problems in divergence form and fix it uh, search G in this case, we, what we do is we look for, we find, we look for, sorry, a limit matrix which belong to the same class up to different constants, such that if we consider each solution to the original problem. So I imagine that for standard reasons, like Milgram, ritz frechet whatever you want, any of this problem admits a unique weak solution in the Sobolev space H10 of omega. If we consider all the sequence of solutions, then we want to find a limit, infinite, still belonging to the same space, such that up to subsequences, we have weak convergence in the topology of H10 of omega. So this is the first requirement. The second requirement, which is very important in the non-symmetric case, because in the non-symmetric case, let's say, if we perturbate here by skew symmetry matrices, the divergence don't, doesn't see it. So we have to ask something more, to have also the convergence of the moment, always in the weak topology, in L2. And then what we ask is if the limit function uh, w infinite is also a solution to a similar problem, to the homogenized problem in the theory of homogenization. Yes. Yes. This is uh, always satisfied in the linear case. Yes. Yes, exactly. So this is, let's say, for free in the symmetric case. While in the non-symmetric one, it's a bit delicate. And uh, I will not go too much into details, but there is an um, important theory called the compensated compactness theory, or Divkar lemma, it's also called, which study, let's say, this part of the problem. Okay, just a few references. As I told you, everything starts from these works from uh, Sanchez Palencia. We are in the 70s, let's say. But at some point, Sanchez Palencia, I think during a conference, met uh, people from the Italian school, which are Ennio de Giorgi and Sergio Spagnolo, that few years before were working in this uh, more general theory of, uh, at that time was called the G convergence. Nowadays, H convergence, H means homogenization. And uh, so they spoke at some point and they realized they were doing similar stuff in different ways. And from that point, uh, also French people starting to develop, um, in particular for the non-symmetric case, this theory. And the most relevant contribution are the one for, uh, from Luc Tartar and François Murat, uh, that nowadays are, let's say, the, in my opinion, the most relevant results in this uh, topic. There is also a contribution of the Russian school, or colleagues here. So the very difficult part is this. We are in the 70s, and 
French people write in French, Italians in Italian, Russian in Russian. So also for me, when I studied for the first time this topic during my PhD thesis, it was almost impossible to find some references. They are published in uh, uh, unknown journal that don't have online service, impossible to find. Um, but even if you find them, they are in Russian or in French. And for me, it was uh, a bit uh, tricky. And um, so my dream at some point is to write a survey or almost a book, let's say, to only to recap all of these results because they are very interested in my opinion. Okay, let me go a bit faster. So now I introduce the non-local part of the story. I don't know if you ever worked with fractional Laplacian or things like that. This is the main idea. I just recall the essential things, so don't worry. And starting from classical, I call sometimes local to distinguish between the non-local part, local sublet spaces. And it has been introduced also the notion of fractional sublet spaces. Also here, I found a PhD thesis about 10 different ways to define them and the equivalence between the definition. In particular, in the case, in the Albertian case, P equal to two, uh, they are mostly all equivalent, apart from the spectral one in which we have to have exactly the same eigenvalues of the Laplacian, but this is something different. And the most known one are the one by means of the Gallardo semi-norm or by means of Fourier transform. But now we have a problem, which is our problem. If you remind, we want to work with divergence problem, problem in divergence form. How can we characterize a divergence form in the non-local setting? This is a problem. In particular, because the space HS, where S is our fractional parameter between zero and one, uh, does not have an evident distributional nature. In particular, the Gallardo semi-norm does not seem to be the L2 norm of a weak gradient in any possible sense. So what has been studied very recently by Xi Spector and then by Comey and Stephanie is a new notion of S-fractional divergence and S-fractional gradient. And we are lucky because in the case P equal to two, they somehow define fractional sublet space spaces that are equivalent to the one we had before. These notions are a bit technical, but you can see are defined in all our n, like an integral of the scalar product between the, the gradient it will be at the end, and the points. And here we have the, um, the Ritz kernel. But what is more important, apart from the definition, is their properties that I will go to show you in a few moments. Uh, the properties are this. So first, if we consider minus fractional divergence of the fractional gradient of U for the same fractional index, we recover exactly the uh, fractional Laplacian. This is in for P equal to two, huh? this is important. Uh, the second, but maybe in my opinion, the most important property is that these operators are dual. Dual in which sense? That the integration by parts formula hold. So in analysis, this is maybe one of the most important results we have. Without this, we cannot talk about uh, uh, weak definitions, uh, weak solutions, and whatever it is. So once we have this, we have done half of the work. The other relevant properties are a Leibniz rule, so the gradient, S gradient of a product, which is which has, let's say, a remainder non-local term that we can control. So it's bad, but not too bad. We have also a Poincaré type inequality, and very, very important, a relic theorem. So we have a compacted bending between the space H0S in L2, where H0S for us is the closure of regular functions in omega by means of the norm in Rn, depending on the norm L2 norm of U and L2 norm of the S gradient of U. 
So this is the main novelty of these definitions. Okay, this is all about this fractional setting. All we need, and as I said, this theory was initiated by Shin Spector in 2015, so very, very recent, and is still underdeveloped, studied by Komi Stefani, so, um, and also some German colleagues, Caroline Kreisbeck and her students. Okay, let me go to the main results. The main result is, let's say, one, and some sketch of the proof. So if you remind at the beginning, we defined the class of matrices with the bounds between the two constants. And this, uh, let me go back, sorry, very fast. This definition here makes sense inside Omega. So for people working in fractional stuff, you know that uh, it is a problem when we have a bounded domain and we study, for instance, the fractional Laplacian, because once we move to the boundary of the set, we should know information also outside the set because the fractional Laplacian, the fractional operators are not local. So we cannot localize inside the set. So um, we have to extend the notion of this class of matrices. And what we do, this is just our choice. It can be uh, modified, improved. So if you have suggestions, please let me know. We said, First, fix a matrix in the sense of the former definition. So we have the control of the bounds, but this is in all Rn. Our main class will be given by matrices that outside of omega coincide with a constant matrix A0. Okay, so we belong to this class inside omega. Outside, we stop them in some sense, we lock with a constant matrix. The symmetric part is not now relevant. And now we are able to write finally the uh, divergence, the fractional divergence problem, which are given by minus fractional divergence of matrices belonging to this class times the fractional gradient of u equal to a fixed data f inside omega. And u equal, so what is the Dirichlet boundary condition in the fractional setting? we should work in all the remaining of our n. So we should impose u equal to zero, not only in the boundary, it's not somehow clear what is a boundary, but in our n, sometimes minus the closure of omega or minus omega in this case. And for, is, for us now at this point, the uh, divergence behave like this after the integration by parts formula. So the... Um, First question is, uh, do these problems admit a solution? Is it unique? Can we give some bounds for the solution? The answer is uh, positive. And for any H, so for any problem, we can find exactly one weak solution in the sense that this uh, equality hold. And we also have standard bounds, like in the local case. And like in the local case, once we have all the construction of the second part of the presentation, it is just an application of lax milgram lemma or ritz fresche in the symmetric case. The main result, oh, sorry, uh, so the goal now is to find a limit matrix, at least for different constants, such that we have H convergence, but now we have to define again what is H convergence, because as I told you before, it depends on the class of matrices and on the problems. So we give uh, uh, this uh, definition. So this is the first time it is uh, done. So maybe it's not the best, but we hope it is. And we say that the sequence of matrices H converges to the limit one. If again, we have convergence of solution weakly, and the convergence of the momentum. And the main result we achieved is not only we have H convergence, but we also have compactness of the class, meaning that the constants that control from above and below the limit matrices are exactly the same of the starting sequence. Otherwise they could be bigger, the upper one, and lower the um, lower one. 
so if we have a few minutes, uh, I just give you an um, idea of the proof. There are two important results that are used at the beginning of the proof, which are given in the local setting by Tartar. The first one is if we reduce to the classical Dirichlet problem with the local divergence, the class is compact again, so we have H convergence. And one of the results uh, which is um, not so trivial is that if we consider the transpose matrices, once we have H convergence for the starting matrices, it also holds for the transpose one to the transpose of the limit. So the idea now is to work like this. First, for any J, we um, only work inside omega, and we call BJ now this uh, matrix here. And by the standard theory, we have, lim we have a H limit. So now we call what we hope will be the limit uh, matrix inside omega, the one given by the local uh, theory. And A0, where A0 was how we fixed the, the matrices outside omega, what happens outside omega? And what we want to show is, in fact, there is H convergence in the fractional sense. Um, let's say that if we consider the sequence of solutions, so now we know there is one solution for any problem, we consider the sequence of what solution, by the bounds, by the reflexivity of the spaces, we have a limit. But we don't know if this limit is also a solution of a divergence problem. We also consider the sequence of momenta. They also are bounded in a reflexive space. They also have a limit, but we don't know anything about this limit, either if it is something of the form matrix time gradient. So what we have to show, which is the most complicated part, is that this limit, limits speak together themselves. So that M is exactly the momentum of the limit by means of the matrix we defined before. So now I stop here with the sketch of the proof, but just to let you know inside, sorry, outside Omega, is uh, trivial. Let's say it's just uh, by the definition of the limit matrices. Inside omega is the hell. Uh, we have to use local techniques, all the properties we gave before for the fractional uh, operators. But the most complicated part, uh, which um, took almost two years to write uh, this um, proof, is that all the original theory works for with localization arguments. So we consider compact set inside omega, cut off functions, and then we extend to all omega. And all this uh, part of the theory cannot work uh, with non-local things. And what helps us is, uh, I skipped it before, is the fact that this fractional divergence and this fractional gradient can be seen like a composition of the local corresponding one, and there is potential. With this attempt, we can also apply localization arguments, and we are also surprised about that, but it, it seems to work, everything. So, um, future perspectives. Can we extend for p greater than two? So as I told you, for p equal to two, everything is equivalent in the fractional uh, setting. For p greater than two, we have, let's say, um, inclusions between Sobol F sets. So it's not so easy to treat. Then what is done in the classical literature, once you have the linear case, is to move to the monotone one. So where instead of having divergence of a matrix times the gradient, we have a Karateodori function that it's points and gradients. And this is a totally open question. The other one that we are now working in this is to extend the so-called div lemma and the compensated compactness theory to this fractional setting. And then it is mostly related to my former studies in my PhD thesis to consider also other frameworks like sub-Riemannian manifolds 
for instance, Heisenberg groups, Carnot groups, and so on. Um, just to conclude, why I'm interested in uh, fractional stuff? Because with my um, mm -hmm. uh, supervisor, Xavier Cabré, we are now working in extending uh, well-known results given by Consul and Sora Morales to the fractional setting. So this is nothing now that we, I'm going to talk about, but this is the project here, uh, the concrete project here at CRM. And we are considering allen Cannell in nonlinearities, which are very, very important in the theory of partial differential equations and applications. And we consider a Neumann boundary condition recently introduced by Di Piero, Rossotone, and Baldinoci, which are totally new. So this is a very interesting class of problems we hope to study soon. OK, um, very few slides more. So first I said, this is a collaboration with two young uh, Italian mathematicians. And uh, mm, it was possible because last December, Michael, one of the two guys, was hosted here by the campus of the UAB, thanks to the analysis uh, seminars that happen every Thursday. They have a little of budget, so they uh, helped us in hosting Michael for one week. And just recently, I discovered by Arancha that there is a, a great opportunity at CRM, which is a sort of research in Perth project. So I just uh, tell you, if you are interested, I'm interested, so I will apply soon, that people, let's say a minimum of two, maximum of six, uh, I think, it's written somewhere, yes, can be hosted uh, here like a co-funding, if I understood correctly. So there should be also some other fundings uh, in the background to work together in uh, top quality, I hope this is top quality, <laughs> research in, um, here at CRM. And last uh, advertisement is uh, related, so there was a spoiler by Carmen before, is this uh, class I'm going, I'm very happy to be able to give, not here, but at UB, but only because people working on these topics uh, live around UB, mostly. <laughs> And this is uh, the theory of gamma convergence. So now I didn't speak about gamma convergence, but if you restrict to the symmetric case, so you can move from the problem to the Euler-Lagrange, uh, let's say to the energy, sorry. All this theory can be formulated by, in my opinion, a better theory, which is the gamma convergence studied by De Giorgi. And this here is exactly 50 years story. And I am very happy to uh, be able to give this class in November and December, Tuesday and Thursday from 11 to one. So I will be very happy if you would join. And just another thing, today is the 23rd of May, and this is exactly five years from my first talk, like a PhD student. So uh, just coincidence, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you.